Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. Hey, Mark. Yep. All right, um, I'm going to take the introduction here. Um, I don't know if I can pin myself. Uh, give me a second if I can pin the video. All right, hopefully everyone can see me. Um, yeah, welcome to this. Uh, uh, is it? The, I think it's the fourth lecture or the third, like on post anarchism. Um, I've known Dwayne for quite a while now, and I've, it's been a pleasure working with him and doing cartel work. But I just want to sort of go over a few of the things that, you know, what makes Dwayne's work impressive. I mean, like the list of the works that he's actually produced. He's post-anarchism, after post-anarchism, Lacanian realism, Jacques Lacan, an American uh, sociology, gender, sexuality, and subjectivity. The last book, which uh, I've just written a review of as well, is on love, psychoanalysis, religion, and society. And one thing that strikes me a lot about about Dwayne's work is his right now his his ten this tendency to try and go beyond Zizek, and what that this means for me is it's 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 a recognition it's a recognition of the degeneration of the pater, what we call the paternal signifier. And you know you can find a lot of scholars that you know up there that talk about oh well there's a problem with the paternal signifier the, we need to reinstantiate it. And we get uh, per various permutations of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, conservative politics that come from that. What, what really strikes me with, with Dwayne's work is the honesty in which he says, yes, there is a problem with this fall of the paternal signifier. No, we don't want to return to a type of conservatism. We need to recognize the danger of uh, the rise of fraternities, the ones all alone. And we do need to move forward and a way of being able to speak to the other. We need to be able to speak from this new, um, uh, the, the, the digital mire that we find ourselves in where everyone is uh, trapped in bubbles uh, and cannot reach out to other. And no sense of organization can rise from that, especially in the stage of capitalism that we're in. But we seem to see in a lot of, I don't know, sort of Slovenian um, school philosophy or socialism or socialist orientated Lacanianism is this need for a return to desire. And what I get from Dwayne's work is the need to be able to move outwards and giving up the fantasy of a return to, to desire. And yeah, I mean, and this, this stems from his... his um, it stems from his intrepid uh, and constant fixation and diligence on the latest Lacan. And as an anarchist, as well, not my, myself as an anarchist, I'm, um, as an anarchist, he wants to be able to show how this, the latest Lacan, is an appropriate language to be able to address the problems that face, uh, well, most forms of left-wing politics today, but he wants to be able to talk in relation to anarchism. So on that, I'm going to hand you over, and over to, my, to my good friend and colleague, Dwayne Russell. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm not sure how to, uh, is it just me where I'm just off in the corner? Um, I mean, I'm I showing up on the main screen. It. You want to get me off of this now with the? <laughs> no, I don't want to get you. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. Maybe I'll just go way. into. Am I showing up for everybody? Okay. There we. No, you're. you're now you are. I've removed the pen. I am. Okay. <laughs> yep. Um, it's not for me. I don't know what to do. I'll just have to. So go when you talk, you show up. What, what's that? Cyber. When you're speaking, yeah. it. It makes you appear. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks um, for showing up. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. I know for some of you it must be quite late um, in Russia. Um, is it late or is it early? It's late, Yulia. Yeah, Roman. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Mark, uh, for your spark. I I thought what I would do was begin with a joke. It's a joke that was told to me by somebody who I don't think is here, uh, namely Zuleika. Um, 
I'm just going to repeat it in my own way. It's not very funny, but I laughed hysterically when I heard it. I was laughing so much the other night when I heard this. Um, okay, a man goes to the grocery store and he asks the clerk for 1,000 eggs. It's a, it's a really small shop, okay? So the clerk informed the customer that he only had a few dozen eggs. It's a problem. He's only got a few dozen eggs in stock. So the customers seemed disappointed, left the store, but he returned the next day. He asked again, do you have 1,000 eggs? The clerk, a bit surprised now, why'd he come back? Gave the same response. I'm sorry, I only have maybe two dozen eggs in stock. And this continued day after day, month after month. Until the clerk realized, I think, clever clerk, that he was missing out on an important business opportunity and also maybe a way to stop him from coming back over and over again. So what he does is he goes out to a bunch of farms or shops, he collects a thousand eggs. The next morning, as you could have predicted, the man returns to the shop and he says, do you have 1000 eggs? The clerk responds, as a matter of fact, I do. The customer smiles and says, okay, I'll take one of them. It's okay, it's a really stupid joke. Um, and it was told to me a little bit different, but it's clear to me that there's something at stake in this joke. I don't know why it spoke to me. The customer would have kept, because I asked, I, I wrecked the joke, you know, I asked Zulia the other night, I said, would he have kept coming back? What happens next? He would have kept coming day after day after day. There's a repetition at stake in the joke. And the clerk thought he found a way to stop that repetition, to put it to an end. But he, he discovered that there was a stubbornness in the, in the man. I'm not gonna analyze the joke much, much further. Okay, so today, I, um, I don't think I can promise that the lecture is going to be altogether easy to follow. I apologize for that. But what you can do is, you know, I think what I'm gonna do is try and develop and summarize thoughts that were introduced in prior lectures, the three prior lectures. Um, so if you feel a little bit lost today, maybe what you can do is after today, once you're thoroughly confused, you can go back and you can watch those three prior lectures that are available on YouTube. Today, what I'm going to offer is a final lecture in the lecture series on post-anarchism and psychoanalysis. And I think it makes this particular lecture um, a serious one. It's a serious one. That's what I provided, I was thinking about it. I provided a lecture series. And today what I wanna do is I wanna sort of circumscribe what it was within that series that was most serious. The first seminar or lecture was framed by a discussion of what I called revolutionary melancholia. Revolutionary melancholia led me to introduce a distinction that I thought was really important be a distinction between, on the one hand, revolutionary aspirations, and on the other hand, uh, revolutionary impulses. Post-anarchists have written a heck of a lot about the former, revolutionary aspirations. For example, there's an excellent essay. I, I just thought of it now because I, I hope I can talk about it. I don't know if I will. I don't know what the heck I'm going to say today. But I posted this, um, this essay by Saul Newman from the anarchistlibrary.org, it was published on there. Um, you can go read it if you like later, titled Interrogating the Master. And he talks about these, what I call aspirations. These aspirations operate along the pathways of desire. I feel like I'm very verbose about my point. What Mark was saying a moment ago, as usual, he says it better and more concisely than I ever could. And, and I think it's even better than anything I could say. But it, it operates along the pathway of desire. And it's exemplified in those hysterics, those hysterical revolutionaries who interrogated Jacques Lacan during the French uprisings in the late 1960s. They had revolutionary aspirations. And you already know his response. 
as revolutionaries, what you aspire to is a master. You will get it. Uh, okay, it wasn't a threat. He, he wasn't threatening the revolutionaries. I don't think he was threatening. It was a prophecy. And, you know, Mark and Wan Young, maybe the two of you will appreciate this. I do believe in prophets. I think Lacan was a prophet. It's a prophecy. And maybe it's a question we might explore one day. Maybe Mark and I will explore one day. What is a prophecy? But what those revolutionaries demonstrated was that their desires were supported by the world. In this way, Lacan proposed, and I think Newman pointed this out really well in his essay in a really nice way, that the, they remained fundamentally committed to the world, which was um, a world of mastery. So, so much for the revolutionary aspirations. There's also revolutionary impulses. And they operate along the circuit of the drive. What psychoanalysts call the drive, what Freud called the drive, the drive. It's a movement from desire toward what Freud called the drive. These impulses operate outside of the symbolic and imaginary coordinates of the world. And this is why we can claim that they're lawless. They're without law. They cannot be governed. They radically resist. Lawlessness occurs when there's a much more fundamental resistance to the world. When in the final instance, one resists incorporation into the world. That's how I see it. It's a simple point, but, and you know, incidentally for a really long time, um, there's been these critical debates, mostly originating within Lacanian circles about the proper translation of this word, this concept from Freud, drive, drive, instinct, impulses. Lacanians are really sticky, stubborn about this. They want to make a distinction and they really want others to know that there's a distinction between drives, instincts, impulses, whatever. And the thought occurred to them that the standard translation conflated these concepts. And it's important to, uh, to affect a separation between them. But I actually don't see why we can't maintain that conflation. Because the impulses, it seems to me, have this non-discursive, almost biological locus. Anyway, I stumbled upon a point that really fascinated me. Uh, it still fascinates me. I'm struck by it because I wondered why nobody else noticed it until now. Why hasn't, for example, Daniel Coulson, I don't know how many of you have heard of this philosopher, Daniel Coulson, a post-anarchist thinker. Um, you can Google him if you like. When he was researching for his work, his essay on Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, the classical anarchist, and Jacques Lacan, when he was talking about the Pointe de Capitan and all this other stuff, why didn't he notice and others, that there's a homology in Lacan's teaching on the concept of revolution and real. These two concepts, revolution and real. <clears throat> it's a point within Lacan's teaching. He provided the same definition for both concepts, revolution and real. It's remarkable to me. It means that Lacan was a bit of a revolutionary, in fact. He committed to the concept of the real and to the revolution that would not, he, he committed to a real and a revolution that would not return the subject into the world of mastery. It makes him a bit of a revolutionary, maybe not the type you might imagine, but what was at stake in each concept? In both cases, we were told by Lacan at different times, but he tells us that What's at stake? It's, uh, it's the rotations of the heavenly bodies, which was also what was at stake in the reel of science we later discover in Lacan. The heavenly bodies, they always, they revolve, they return, they return to their place. It's a reel that revolves. It's a revolutionary reel. 
the real and revolution are synonymous concepts because they target a logic of returning to its place and resisting the symbolic. And it points toward a concept I heard Marx say, and I'm happy he said it, I think he said it quite consciously, fixation. A key word for Freud, Freud called that a fixation. At this point, we reach something that's really stubborn. A fixation is a stubborn thing. The fixation at the core of the real, of revolution, forces us to be really serious. It forces us to be really serious, stubborn. Jared, maybe it even makes us stern. We find this in, psycho, in, in, in psychoanalysis, in a psychoanalytic session even. This is exactly what you find in a psychoanalytic session. You know, as the time passes, as the months go on, day after day, the patient, your customer keeps returning back to you, asking maybe the same question, <laughs> keeps coming back. And there are therapeutic effects along the way, but still in the final instance, there's something of our suffering, something of our enjoyment, jouissance that remains, that persists, that continues, that repeats. It's stubborn and it's fixed. And the sessions keep going on like that, demonstrating that we only become, I don't know why I'm thinking of Jared at this particular moment. Um, we only become more and more stern, stubborn. We become more and more stern, we become sterner. <laughs> For us, it necessitates a theory of repetition and fixation concerning the revolutionary impulses. What is it that repeats in the impulses? The stubborn fixation, we can take it as one. One. And it's a one of enigmatic jouissance. I don't know what we can say about it. It's, it's a one of enigmatic jouissance, which we can. If we like, we can isolate it from the series of repetitions as Lacan did in his later teaching. We can isolate from the series of repetition and we can localize it. Maybe it's a trauma. Maybe there's a trauma there. There is a trauma at the core of any law, of any representation, of any meaning, of any image and you know, I was even thinking about this the other day because I did this interview with Daniel Tutt. It was a really lazy interview for me. I don't know why I was so quiet, but um, the, the topic came up of uh, jouissance and the political. Maybe we can be led to believe there's a political jouissance that bears some relation to the stubborn one, a political jouissance. It's a point that I think was really underdeveloped in the work of Slavo Žižek, who, Maybe you know, Vulcan probably knows this really well. Um, in, the, in the 1990s, was it? Early, early 1990s, he was among the very first, maybe late 1980s even, among the very first, though still long after Lacan and Jacques Alain Miller, to argue that enjoyment, jouissance, is, it can be taken as a political factor. So I see myself following Zizek in that direction but I do it in my own way, my own lonely way. And I was thinking about how he's always so fond, my good friend Savoy, he's always so fond of saying, we should be willing to go to the end. I'm even willing to go to the end. Take note of it when you hear him speak over the years. We should be willing to go to the end. He always, Slavoj always supports my work and he's, he's, he's um, encouraged me to be critical of his, which shows some quite, uh, he's, a vir he's a virtuous thinker, I think. Um, but nonetheless, I feel like I need to ask him this question. I'm asking it to you though. Why didn't you, Slavoj, why didn't you go to the end of your analysis with Jacques Alain Miller? It's a question. It's a discussion concerning the end of analysis and the end of the world. If there's a political trauma that we can isolate in the domain of politics, 
then what those hysterical revolutionaries demonstrated, I think, is that their hysteria was a mode of defense against trauma. In the end, hysterics prefer to maintain their relationship to the world and to the master. So the hysteric is the one who's not entirely willing to go to the end. And it's probably why there's, I was thinking about this this morning. Why are there so few people who have gone to the end of their analysis? What does it say about psychoanalysis? There's so very few. And it's a problem for me. I don't know why I need to think about it. Why are there so few who have gone to the end of analysis? And not only are there very few who have gone to the end of their analysis, but even those who, who have in some sense, maybe we can verify that they've gone to the end of their analysis and verify it in ways that we can talk about. They nonetheless return again for more analysis. Analysis terminable and interminable. And so they return again. Um, the goal of analysis, as I understand it, is, hey Clyde, is, uh, is quite simply, I think, to transform the hysteric into an analyst. You know, to transform the hysteric into one who's willing to go to the end, who does go to the end and who goes beyond the end. Um, but, okay, I've lost my thread. I need to figure out what I was talking about a moment ago. The anarchist, I think, is the one for whom politics also consists of contingent encounters with what exists outside of the world, outside of the world of master. So I think there's really two anarchist traditions, ultimately. And they don't necessarily operate in isolation from one another. What I want to con convince you of, and I'm not sure I I'm capable of it, but I want to convince you that it's not exactly progress when the anarchist overcomes the world of mastery. The situation can, get, can become much worse. And the world itself can become something like a cruel master. The master becomes real. I thought about, maybe I should have called today's lecture, the master or worse. The master dot 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 or worse. It's a movement from a world that's characterized by internal problems and inconsistency, oppression, exploitation, and these sorts of things toward a world. So, so that's a world of suffering. Toward a world that um, has, toward, from suffering to trauma, a trauma without a world. That's the movement as I see it. A world without, a world that cannot house the trauma. So from suffering to trauma, and that's not progress. It's worse. And it's why Lacan's seminar, I think increasingly it's the most important seminar, which occurred at, during the period of uprisings. It was titled dot, 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 ellipsis, or worse. And we all know now what it was supposed to be called. Do you know what it was supposed to be called? The father or worse. It was supposed to be called the father or worse. But the father's missing from the symbolic. It's not written there. It's missing from the symbolic. So you just have to imagine that the father's there. And that's exactly what you do. The father or worse. It was a point that led me to a third lecture or seminar uh, on the topic of what, what it is precisely that is worse. So I spoke about what I call singularities. That's what I call them. I'm more and more not liking the concept, so I'm starting to get rid of it. But I examined their logic and, and I paid particular attention to the newest social movements. I turned to the work of Todd May, who I know uh, two of you know, maybe more. Todd May and Richard J.F. Day to try and show how post-anarchist theory succumbed to the temptation to remain complicit with the contemporary 
uh, political world or what there is of one. A world of weakening prohibitions. And it's not, you know, I was thinking it's not a discovery I'm happy about. I'm not trying to stir stuff up, maybe a little bit, but, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not happy about it. I was inspired at one time by the work of May and Day. But now, what is it? It's June and it's night. May Day's over. Um, things have changed in the years that have passed. The world's gone dark. And so it's surprising to me that, that I'm not inspired by those ideas anymore. I find that surprising. And you know, I don't mind being surprised. But it's clear to me, and I mentioned it in a previous lecture, that not many people like to be surprised anymore. And I even tried to claim that what has been most essential at the very core of what post-anarchism has offered um, was that it surprised us. It surprised anarchists the anarchist tradition, it surprised us. We became surprised by what we've been saying for what, 150 years or more as anarchists. The anarchists became surprised to themselves. We surprised ourselves, which doesn't mean we didn't surprise the Marxists because the anarchists certainly surprised the Marxists in the classical tradition as well. They surprised the world, the modern world. It was a world of revolutions and it was surprising to a lot of people. What was most important about post-anarchism, I maintain this conviction, it was that it surprised us. And it's a fundamental point because post-anarchism surprised us by demonstrating to us that the modern or classical anarchist tradition was a defense against our revolutionary impulses. We preferred to remain complicit in the world of mastery. It surprised us. We were reproducing the same world of mastery. And, and all of that was surprising to us. So, you know, and I remember during the time of post-anarchism that some people thought that our theories were a joke. They were, they were laughing at, at post-anarchists. They thought it was stupid, nonsensical, fashionable nonsense. They thought it was French arrogance all these various things, but they thought it was a joke. And it might surprise you to learn that I'm happy they thought it was a joke. That was the point. Like if you, you know what Freud said about jokes, jokes have a fundamental relationship to the unconscious. Freud showed us where the joke leads. It leads to the unconscious. And today it's difficult to tell a joke maybe less so, I'm feeling that things are changing now, but it's quite difficult to tell a joke. Did I ever tell some of you, maybe I told Mark, maybe I told Roman, Paulina, who, I don't know, I might've told some of you why I ended up going to Russia, it's a tangent. When I was teaching in Ontario at a university there, I told a joke in the class, there was nothing perverse or twisted, it was just an innocent joke, totally relevant. The Dean called me, said jokes have no place in the classroom. Learning is serious business. Oh yeah, that's a great book. That's a good book. I know that book. Um, so, so we have to learn how to be surprised again somehow. It's not easy. The joke can only exist in a world where you aspire toward liberation. We seem to witness today comedians I think that book demonstrates it, the book you're holding up. Um, it demonstrates that comedians have moved from aspiration to perspiration. Now they sweat on stage. They're sweating instead of laughing. When you're outside of the world, jokes become insulting to you. Um, and you know, I'm not trying to be insulting, but my feeling is that we are in the worst of times. That's what I think. I don't think we're, uh, we're approaching some sort of an apocalypse to come. I don't think we're approaching the end. I think it already happened. And I mean it 
like I'm serious about that. I think the end of the world has already occurred. Maybe I was talking about Nietzsche earlier to somebody on the phone. Maybe I, I'm like Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche's holding his lantern, yelling, the world is already dead and you've killed it. This is what I'm basically saying. We've lost our world. In some sense, we're all homeless today. So I would say to get back on track, our social bonds are increasingly structured because of this, according to a logic of segregation. The newest social movements have demonstrated this point very well. They're not alone in showing it to us, but they demonstrate it to us very well. These are fraternal social bonds. Singularities. When the paternal function weakens, when there is, as Slavoj Žižek says, uh, a decline of symbolic efficiency or the paternal function, a weakening of the nom de pair, whatever you want to call it, you can, you can start to see the real cunning of the father, of the master. It's a cunning master. The nom de pair. The pair, the father, becomes a peer or a pair. The organizing principle of the nom de pair uh, becomes replaced by a principle of what I call a ton nom mi, a ton nom mi, which institutes this lonely mode of traumatic, unspeakable suffering. The fraternal function replaces the paternal function. So oppression and exploitation, exploitation occur less explicitly and more implicitly through a logic of segregation. And I think Lacan insisted upon this fact in his, uh, uh, in his when, he, when he said, you know, maybe you think the fraternity, the commune, the affinity group, the collective, the, the autonomous zone, whatever the fuck you wanna call it, maybe you think that'll give you some freedom. But what Lacan insisted upon was that it's only the psychoanalytic discourse that provides a counterpoint to the world of mastery to patriarchy. And why? It's because psychoanalysis disrupts the tendency toward hierarchy and fraternity, both. So I, um, I risk the claim that our problem today is not at all what some psychologist, a Canadian psychologist named Jordan Peterson says, and some others, you know, the end of patriarchy, oh, we're witnessing the end of culture and all this other stuff. That's not the problem. It's worse than that. I don't care about the fact that hierarchies might exist in nature. It doesn't get to the, I don't think it gets to the heart of the problem that we're facing today. Patriarchy has become worse. And it's a paradox to me. It, sh it shifted from the symbolic to the real. On the one hand, you have vertical social bonds, which make up symbolic patriarchy, to put it really simply. And on the other hand, there's something of the father that exists outside of the vertical world, a real father. It's a father whose presence is felt more severely, severely. Ah, there's a word that resonates for me because I don't know if you can see this. When I was really young, I got this tattoo. It says perseverance. And I just thought, as I said, severely, perseverance, 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 just a stupid wordplay. But his, 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 his presence is felt more severely. Maybe we can claim that the father becomes the world. And it's from this world father that the subject stages her retreat. Patriarchy can therefore, it can continue to exist according to a horizontal principle of fraternity. And I don't see why we can't even claim that class can function that way. We can say class can function according to a logic of fraternity. Fraternity without a master exists outside of the world. When the symbolic prohibition against Jewessance becomes ineffective. The cut comes from the real, not the signifier, but the razor blade or the insult. 
And paradoxically, you feel the prohibitions even more. So I think the fraternal group really does feel the weight of the world upon their shoulders. The, the internal consistency and integrity of the group is secured not through prohibitions, but segregations. The group segregates together in isolation from the world. And that's how Lacan put it, by the way. I, I don't remember where he said it, but they isolate together. It's weird. It sounds weird. You're isolating in a lonely group, but you're together. Uh, it's a lonely segregation of ones. Like how I was thinking about it, and I'm just saying it to provoke. I mean, I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm stupid here. Like I can be convinced otherwise, but how is it that at a period when the patriarchy is most under attack, that fathers also seem to be felt as even more tyrannical? The other mode of social organization, this other mode of social organization, led me to think about um, the psychoanalytic notion of the cartel. I don't know if you know this word cartel, but uh, you know, look, it, Lacan didn't invent the word. I realized that the word was actually developed in the context of war before Lacan even started to use the, the word. Um, but as formulated by Lacan, the cartel was meant to be the psychoanalytic cartel as a psychoanalytic group of sorts. It was meant to be a social bond that would not be predicated upon the principles of prohibition or fraternity. Neither hierarchy nor fraternity. Neither prohibition nor affirmation of Jewish Neither hierarchy nor fraternity, neither exploitation nor segregation, and so on. And, you know, many people presume that the cartel is is uh, simply a Lacanian reading group. It's not, it's, there's something much more important at stake in the cartel. It's a principle of the social bond. It's a non-fraternizing, non-hierarchical social bond, or it's meant to be, it strives to be. It goes further than the anarchists themselves could ever go in forming a social bond that is free of the father. Because the anarchists weren't willing to go to the end. So it's a post, the cartel is a post anarchist social bond in some sense. Pass anarchist social bond. What do you say, Mark? Pass anarchist. Pass, pass anarchist. Yeah, that's nice too. We'll have to think about that one. Um, okay, so Lacan began to um, develop the basic coordinates for the cartel very early in his teaching. There is even a great essay that I think really captures what's at stake in, in, in the development of the cartel in this early period of Lacan's teaching. I think it was published by Eric Laurent maybe 20 years ago, titled The Real and the Group, if you want to read it. Lacan, Lacan's report, which he presented in, I don't know, I think that the late 1940s, maybe, maybe early 1950s, it was titled I don't know why I can't remember the date now. 47 sounds right, but I might be wrong. It was titled British Psychiatry and the War. And it examined the formation of small groups of soldiers during the Second World War, whose uh, direction was ensured by psychiatrists, inspired by psychoanalysis. And we might imagine the cartel to be roughly homogenous with what anarchists call the affinity group or the collective. I don't know if you know this term affinity group. Uh, why not though? Why can't it be? Maybe in some sense it is. Murray Bookchin, who I had the, I wouldn't say the pleasure of meeting in Vermont many years ago, 
an anarchist. Let's just call him the Dean. I met the Dean in Vermont many years ago, but he reasoned, I think quite persuasively that the anarchist affinity group model was, was uh, discovered in the context of war just before the Spanish Civil War, Spanish Revolution, by the FAI, a militant anarchist group. And so there was something about war in the development of the cartel, and we can explore why. So I'm not going to do that today, but the trauma that, it, that war reveals and the subsequent dissolution of the social bond that war seems to produce. We all end up scattered. It, but it necessitates something. It necessitates an invention of sorts. You know, I'm not without realizing it, as I know many of you, because I fled Russia. Some of you have fled your families or have tried to, so you're not without realizing it. You need to invent a social link. So the war led Freud to conceptualize a notion of death drive. Nice invention. Lacan, it led him to develop the basic coordinates of the cartel, principal organ of the psychoanalytic school. As for the anarchists, it led them to develop, to invent the affinity group, the affinity group model. Finally, Stirner, whose work I'll come back to soon enough, he wrote about uh, Roman. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'll get, I'm gonna ask Roman a question in a little bit, actually. I asked him to say something, but just hold off. I need, I wanna develop something. Stirner developed the concept of the union of egos. When, during a moment, when the German social bond was beginning to erode, just before the revolution, the German revolutions in the 1840s. Anyway, I have a quote from Bookchin, so I want to read it. It'll give you a sense of what the affinity group is. Quote, the term affinity group is the English translate, sorry, the dean wrote this. The term affinity group is the English translation of the Spanish group de affinidad, which was the name of an organizational form de devised as the basis of the FAI, the Iberian Anarchist Federation. It could easily be regarded as a new type of extended family. Sounds a bit like Frederick Engels here for some reason, in which kinship ties are replaced by deeply empathetic human relationships, caring human relationships, maybe. Long before the word tribe gained popularity in the American counterculture, the Spanish anarchists called their congresses assemblies of the tribes. Each affinity group is deliberately kept small to allow for the greatest degree of intimacy between those who compose it. Autonomous, communal, and de directly democratic, the group combines revolutionary theory with revolutionary lifestyle and creates a free space in which revolutionaries can remake themselves individually and as social beings. I think it's a great quote. It basically tells you what an affinity group is, what it means to be. But I think there's clear differences between the cartel and the affinity group that we really need to talk about. Both are small, intimate social groups. Yes, arranged according to some sort of, um, some sort of work or cause developed, um, and both were developed in the times of war. So there's some similarities. I'm sure we can think of some others. But the affinity group seems to me functions in much closer proximity to the horizontal principle of fraternity. It is autonomous. From the very beginning, it does not propose to eradicate the internal inclinations of its members toward a group identification. That's not its aim, nor does it aim to eliminate the principle of segregation. I know this very well from my work in anarchist groups. Segregation is a very real thing. They call it voluntary association. I call it segregation. The cartel functions according to a fundamentally different point of departure. It retains, I love this word, Saul Newman used it 
the place of power. The cartel retains the place of power. Oh no, <laughs> it retains the place of power. You can read about this in Saul Newman's book from Bakunin to Lacan. The cartel retains the place of power, but it empties it of its potency. The place of power remains, but its function, it serves a different uh, cause. Let's call it a more revolutionary cause. Rather than affirming the segregation of the group, what in the cartel is called a plus one, an element, an individual, a member, I don't know of the group, the plus one. The plus one in the group, which you might think would be the father of the group or something like that, functions to produce, as uh, Laurent Dupont has put it, psychoanalyst Laurent Dupont, the plus one functions to produce a certain function of desire in its members. Members who might feel quite lazy or tired. Or... It, it's a draining of the jouissance that's at play in the affirmative impulses that we have. It's why the plus one is neither a master nor a, a caretaker. The plus one, you know what Miller, Jacques-Alain Miller calls the plus one? An agent, an agent provocateur. The plus one is an agent provocateur. I have a quote from Miller. Quote, the plus one must come with question marks and make holes in heads. This implies that he refuses to be a master who puts others to work, refuses to be the one who knows, refuses to be an analyst in the cartel, and this in order to be that agent provocateur from which there can be a teaching, end quote. I love this quote. You know, Miller was interested when he wrote this quote, it was really quite early for me, I don't, 1980s, I think. Uh, he was really interested in the cartel as a place where knowledge can be produced. He wanted the cartel to be an engine of knowledge. The cartel's function was to produce knowledge, new knowledge. That's not my interest in the cartel, at least not right now. My interest is in the invention of the cartel, which in times of war, it's an invention of a social link. I'm so thankful that I'm involved in some cartel work. This plus one of a cartel occupies the supposed place of power, but serves the cause of disrupting hierarchical aspirations and fraternal impulses, therefore returning each member in the social group back into their loneliness in relation to their cause, their own revolutionary causes. It isolates a fixation in the impulses. And I claim that this is what Miller highlighted, I don't know, like 20 years later in his teaching on the function of, uh, on the psychoanalytic school, the Turin theory of the subject of the school, an essay that you can, that, uh, transcription that you can find online. And it's why Max Stirner's proposal, you know, what he called the union of egoists, why it's been an extremely important intervention within the history of anarchism, extremely important. You'll find that even Frederick Engels and Karl Marx were surprised by Stirner, by his interventions. I happen to like surprises. Stirner offered, I'm gonna get Roman to say something in a moment, but Stirner offered a fundamental challenge, not only to the communist tradition, but also to the anarchist tradition. And not everybody likes surprises. So, the anarchists don't know what to do with Stirner. They'll call him a post-structuralist. They'll call him a nihilist. Maybe that's close. They'll call him um, an individualist. This one really bothers me. You know why it bothers me? Because it's, it's not a charitable reading of Stirner to call him an individualist because there's nothing more individual, which means to be without split division, castration, than a singularity, 
a fraternity, a commune. There's nothing more individual than that. So it's clear that Stirner didn't offer us a blueprint for the union of egoists. He didn't say what it was. I think he only mentioned it in passing like two or three times very quickly. But we all latch on to it because we want a positive proposal of what a social link might look like. He offered us a concept and commentators never fail to mention this concept, the union of egoists. They never fail to mention that he didn't tell us what it, what it was. How do you build this social bond, this collective, this what? Is it an affinity group? What is it? The union of egoists for Stirner is an empty space reserved for a social link that's still possible after the annihilation of the world. Um, and that's quite a bit, I think, because it implies that what he did was he emptied the social bond of its fraternal relations. They're therefore insisting that each member pursue their own cause, unshackled from oppressive hierarchies, moralistic fraternities, and so on. Alan Antliff, um, a friend of mine, reminded me not so long ago in an email that Stirner's Union of Egoists, it was supposed to be made up of insurrectionaries, insurgents, who, how did Stirner put it? Um, no longer allow themselves to be arranged by the world. That's why he was against revolution. He was, he was isolating the impulses. It could mean that they fundamentally refused the determinations of the world. A refusal of surprises. It's a foreclosure of the world, a rejection, uh, maybe a rejection of any constitution which makes it quite different from the sort of, or seems to be quite different from the sort of social order that Sergei Dakiyev proposed, because it had a constitution. There was a secret society. Uh, you can look at it, look it up again, catechisms of, of a revolutionary. It goes point by point. It has a constitution. It's nihilist though. It established a constitution for what I would call the union of egoists, point by point, as a condition of membership into the secret society. But here's the big secret. The secret is that there's no proof that his secret society had any members in it. There were rumors that it had tens of thousands and people were afraid of him. There's no evidence that there was any member to this, no members to this group except maybe himself, I don't know, I'd have to go back and research it. Maybe there were a couple, but um, it, was a, it was a fraternity, but a strange one because its constitution basically had one function, to empty out all meaning from the world. He said, you know, the revolutionary is a doomed man. He has no religion, no identity, no name, no friends, no morality, no father, Nothing. He's without a world. All he has is the revolutionary impulse. It's his only cause. It's a stubborn conviction. And it's interesting to think about all of this in relation to a passage that I've extracted from Jacques Lemelaire's The Turin Theory of the Subject of the School. I quote, Lacan returns each one to his loneliness as a subject, to the relation that each one has with the master signifier of the ideal beneath which he places himself. In the very moment when Lacan institutes a collective formation, his first words are to dissociate and to bring forward subjective loneliness, end quote. The same with Stirner's Union of Egoists, because the aim was to dissociate from fixed ideas, from what Stirner called spooks, which for him structured the entire world. So Stirner's first suggestion when instituting a social link, the Union of Egoists, was dissociate. 
It was a principle of dissociation. Anyway, I've totally lost my thread. I want to get to Roman. Uh, just one more thing. I've asked Roman to say something in a moment. Um, you know, it's been like a, what um, two a month or two since I the the lecture series I was giving on post anarchism and, and psychoanalysis ended, and it ended prematurely. And then here we are again, suddenly after the end, as Lacan would say, encore. But I was thinking that this lecture should be thought of as an encore. You know, it would seem that I've only reestablished the series, returning to the same place, perpetuating the repetition, the lecture series. But I don't think what I'm doing is offering four lectures. This isn't the fourth lecture. There were three before, Mark. This is the, it's, it's not that I'm offering, I'm not offering four. What I'm, what I'm offering are three lectures plus one. And so I isolate this lecture from the series. I take it by itself all alone. And so I think this one, I'm a bit more stubborn in what I'm saying. It should receive more serious attention. And it occurs to me that Stirner was a really serious thinker, as you know, from his name. That's why he was given the nickname Stirner. I thought it was Engels who gave him that name. I don't think so. He had it for quite a long time. Um, anyway, I've asked my friend Roman um, Islamov to speak for uh, two to three minutes. Uh, about Stirner, uh, and I've asked him for a really important reason. Maybe he won't realize it today. <laughs> really important reason, but hopefully, okay, maybe in two to three minutes, very abridged because I realize I'm speak I, I spoke a lot and I still have a couple things I want to say before we finish, but maybe what Roman can do is, is tell us a little bit very quickly, concisely, what, St what he thinks Stirner's, what you think Stirner's significance is, and maybe if you can, oh, if you can, I don't want to put you in a strange place, but I'd really like to hear what you think about Stirner's reading, why it was important, his reading of Ludwig Feuerbach. For those of you who don't know, maybe you can search this up later. And then after he speaks, I'll try and bring it to, to a conclusion. So if you want to go ahead, I'll, I'll unmute you here. Uh, oh, you can unmute yourself. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about Max Turner, his work, the, the great book, uh, The Ego and Its Own, and particularly about his critique of Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, so Turner has some problems with his, uh, like Feuerbach's critique of humanistic religion. Because according to Feuerbach, want to subvert theology uh, or as it calls it is called speculative philosophy uh, we need to like take those religious uh, prepositions and like change places of the subject and the predicate like um, the predicate becomes the subject and the subject becomes or as he says the principle so for instance if we have if we say God is love like and then we switch place say uh we get love is divine uh, yeah. so what could be wrong with this brilliant critique of religion uh well Cerner notices how the this religious mentality itself uh, still remains it doesn't go anywhere and it, it just gets more subtle and um, because we made the re religious subject uh, the principle of our thinking and with that like uh, we got sacredness, hierarchies, essentialism, and different relations of service, and so on, um, because the structure of this thinking didn't change that much. And we may say that Stoner probably had some structuralist intuitions himself. Yeah, so in this oppressive structure, we are still being alienated from ourselves. We have to serve, if not God, then society, Unity or truth or justice. Or so what Turner himself proposes uh, in that this endless theology is um, complete desacralization and radical dualism, because it is me uh, who should be the center of my world, 
not God, not nature, not humanity or society. Um, yeah, he also has this um, complete the essence, the essence. Oh my God, this word, the essentialization. That means that he radically critiques uh, every essence. He's, he critiques his as spooks, and he says that everyone who believes in those essences is crazy. Uh, yeah, and that's why Sterner mainly opens up a way for the true materialism with you no know, like the big principle behind the material world, you might say. And he talks when he talks about like egoism and ego, he talks about the self dissolving self dissolving ego that doesn't have being, uh, not the absolute ego, but the ego that constantly is constantly changing, and that leaves no room for essences or spooks. Yeah, that's why it is better his um, egoism because it centers ego, uh, not the not the God, not this principle of divinity. Uh, and it j doesn't just switch like places, like uh, in f like Feuerbach does, because that we might call revolution, uh, according to Stoner. But Stoner himself preferred revolt when I of every, every change that is occurring in the world. Uh, I guess that's it for my part. That was that was quite wonderful. Um... Thank you so much, Roman. I heard you say a few things that struck me. I could have also asked Cyber Dandy to say something, maybe in the discussion at the end, if you're interested in, in having a conversation about it. Um, that was really elucidating because I was thinking like, ah, oh, I heard you say, I don't know if you used the word replaced or, it seems like Sterner discovered something that we've been overlooking. And that maybe his comrades or uh, uh, somebody is, oh, I thought the transcriptions were already on. Apologies, kind of late now. Um, he, he, he highlighted something that maybe we've been overlooking and maybe we hadn't thought was that important, even in our readings as post anarchists. Something occurring in the history of ideas. It's a question of the difference, and maybe we could pursue it another day, it would, it would allow me to speak also about my critique of the limitations of Shijip's current project, which is a dialectical project, Alain Badu's project, which is a dialectical project. Because Sterner was a member of the Young Hegelians. And there's a difference between dialectics and repetition. This is what I heard you say, Roman. Oh, you didn't, I mean, this is, I hear it in my own way, <laughs> uh, but I heard something there that provoked me. A difference between dialectics and repetition. A repetition is what he highlighted in the dialectical philosophy of left Hegelian thinking in the work of Ludwig Feuerbach. Within, I have a quote here. Um, I found it while you were talking because I thought it, you reminded me of it. Within Ludwig Feuerbach's dialectical work, there's a repetition. Sturter was really clear about it. I found this passage, maybe I could have found a better one in, in short notice, but this is what I found. Quote, this is Sterner. From Feuerbach took, sorry, what Feuerbach took from God has been super added to man, as you very nicely laid out. And the power of humanity grew greater in proportion to the degree of piety that was lost. You lose belief, piety. Now there's more uh, power of humanity. Man is the God of today. And fear of man has taken the place of the old fear of God. Great quote. And, and I think that's what I got. I mean, you said so much there. We could talk about essentialism, but this part here, I think, fits into what we were saying. He's highlighting, underlining a repetition that was at stake in the dialectic that allowed him to move from repetition to fixation. Sterner isolated something outside of the dialectics of desire, which can be found inside of the repetition compulsion. 
which to put it in I, plain terms is fixation. I wanna quote Alexander Stevens uh, concerning this repetition compulsion. Psychoanalyst Alexander Stevens, quote, it is a repetition compulsion that according to Freud puts us on the trail of the death drive on the basis of the repetition of the traumatic element, end quote. So um, what Stirner demonstrated was that Feuerbach only exchanged uh, a religious conception of God, which preexisted his work, for a humanistic concept, a moralistic conception of man. And that's not progress. It's not progress. It, in fact, and Saul Newman pointed this out only in passing, but I think it was important, it could be worse. It's worse. It returns us back to the same place. And that's what makes it revolutionary. Man, the concept of man, increases the potency of the place of power, but it doesn't evacuate it. It doesn't clear it of its, uh, uh, of its jouissance. Not only does the place of power remain intact, but its function actually improves. It becomes more cunning. The situation becomes worse with the category of man. We move from God, the father, to man, or men, or the brothers, or the comrades. So today's social movements effectuate a similar effect. The newest social movement of which anarchists are just a small part, although they may be prefigured in the future, through cancellation. Don't they, through the practice of cancellation, don't they place the unhuman outside of their social bond, spitting them out, to further consolidate the internal consistency of their own group, moralistic human, man. You know, Eric Laurent, in a short piece titled Racism 2.0 that you can find online, he reminds us, I'll quote him, when Lacan constructed the logic of the social bond, he doesn't begin with the vertical identification with the leader, end quote. And then he goes on by claiming that the logic of the social group goes like this, one, a man knows what is not a man. A man knows what is not a man. Two, men recognize themselves among men in the universal sense of man. It's sexist, I know, but this is how it's written. That's two. Three, I declare myself to be a man for fear of being convinced by men that I'm not a man. A man knows what is not a man. Men recognize themselves among themselves. I declare myself to be a man for, for fear of being convinced by men that I'm not a man. I'm not one. So in other words, it begins, the social bond in this sense from this logic begins according to a logic of segregation. You're isolating from the whole in the concept of man or humanity that you confront in the place of the other. So Stirner located within this repetition an enigmatic and stubborn point of fixation. He was the stubborn fixation. It was him within the Hegelian movement. He was the stubborn element in the Hegelian movement. So if, for example, he thought God's cause, God only cares about himself. The country only cares about itself. Each one takes its cause as itself. Why shouldn't I take my own cause as myself? This is how he puts it. That each is taking its own cause. It's tethered to its own cause. They're singularities. It's an autoerotic fixation, in a sense. Stirner saw singularities. He saw islands of jouissance, self-enclosed, self-interested. And he resolved to dissociate against the fixed ideas the spooks and so on. But the problem, as I see it with Stirner, in the end, he had nothing to believe in. He gives up on all fictions. Fictions, not fixations. Fictions. 
There's a deflation of desire in Stern. He retains the fixation, but dismisses the fictions. So why? He didn't have a plus one. For me, um, I believe in psychoanalysis. Maybe it's silly. And it was anarchism and my revolutionary aspirations that led me to psychoanalysis. So I brought myself to the end. And I think, cause I think there's some anarchists here, maybe some post anarchists and some watching live maybe. I would say what you do with the end is up to you. To go to the end, for me, I would claim it's a type of post, maybe past anarchist politics. It's, it's, um, it's the cartel. So I don't know what I can say about anarchism in the end. Um, but it surprises me that for some reason, after I gave up anarchism, here I am talking about it again. It persists, it continues. Um, I would say that it's, you know, it's up to you, each one of you, one by one, all alone, to find your way with anarchism and with what post-anarchism might be now. That's all I wanted to say. I'm happy to open it up to discussion for a little bit. Sorry, I just muted myself. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. That was a uh, really, really uh, that was really, really tight and uh, re really um, hit the nail on the head. Many and elucidating many other concepts that went before. Uh, there was one thing that really struck me. Um, so, when you were talking about the language of trauma. The language of trauma to me uh, today, it seems to be everywhere. Everyone's talking about trauma and there are different sort of ways of being able to talk about it, especially in sort of the, um, uh, sort of the language of hyperpathologization that we have now that's everywhere and commodified. And uh, there was just something I, I wrote down and I, I don't know whether if you can come over it. The language of trauma is a, is a saturation of a desire for law Trauma is a calling out for the world to remain. The type of uh, language of trauma that we have today now. But the language of, of psychoanalysis addresses trauma in a different way altogether. Right? What was that? What would you, how would you, um, so what I'm saying is that we have the language of psychoanalysis and, it's, and, and trauma, but we have this hyper commodified language of trauma what how could we um pierce it or what, how how what would the difference be i don't have any of that makes sense no it, it does i i just i don't think i have an answer <laughs> it, it's it's tough because you know there is something i don't know i don't know but there's something of uh, uh, trauma you know we can use it as a technical concept or we can use it loosely as we do in popular culture. And I think, um, I think a lot of the communities that we see today in the, maybe even some of the newer social movements, a lot of them are, are maybe organized around the trauma. Yet at the same time, there's a lot of communities that are organized around um, enjoyments and different modes of enjoyment, um, BDSM communities and, and so on. Mark, yeah. No, no, it was. It was um, I, I, I think that you know the work that you're doing is is really important. Um, I was writing something earlier today. Uh, Todd McGowan wrote a, a book a while ago. Um, uh, it was about the end of dissatisfaction. You know this one, 1990, um, end of dissatisfaction, and he says that uh, we're moving from uh, um, a, a time of duty from the past. There was a, this era of duty to one of 
enjoyment the idea of the the, the super egoic in, uh, commandment to enjoy and we need to move over to what he calls uh, this is in the 90s by the way uh, to a, a time of partial enjoyment which is really him just talking about desire you know we need to move towards a society of desire and it makes me realize the stuff that you're doing now it's like well no we've gone beyond that we've gone beyond that with this this trauma this break, um, I, th I think it happened around about 2016, um, but probably before then. And now we're, 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 as you said, we're stuck either in this sort of uh, capitalist discourse, the law of the drive, the fraternity, endless, or as, as Marie Helen Bush says, it's the iron law of the social, um, the monstration of things, constant watching and you know, the breaking off into endless groups. We, and then you have this this want or a, a need to go to a hierarchy of desire, you know the the, the, the reinstantiation of the paternal signifier. But you, you're talking the psychoanalytic discourse is one of a way of talking about enjoyment, mm -hmm. and it's a way of uh, as you you uh, instantiating the cartel. Um, right, and I just think that. that well, I, I would, I wanted to say that, like, what is trauma? Well, for Lacan, you know, the word in French sounds like the word for whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. What produces a whole? In Lacanian thought, what produces a whole could be a signifier. Um, and the signifier can be really traumatizing. When I look at the early work of Lacan, you have the early work of Lacan. And in the early work of Lacan, what do you see? You see at some level that the unconscious is made up of signifiers, a battery of signifiers, chain of signifiers, what Lacan called S2. So you have one signifier points at another signifier. You have the metonymy of signifiers and so on. Okay, this is all fine if you're inaugurated into a symbol, because what it means is you can use signifiers and if you can use signifiers, you can speak to the other because the other is present there, right? Like if I can speak your language, the words you're using, they're not provoking me. They're not provoking me because in some sense I've accepted the signifier. What's traumatic is when the signifier becomes a trigger, not as one signifier representing a subject for another signifier as what we had in the, in the early middle period of Lacan. I don't know when exactly, you know, but because at that point, you could say the subject is represented by a signifier for another signifier. The subject is a lack, constitutive lack within the battery of signifiers. We're not in that world. I'm sorry, yeah. we're not in that world. We're in a world where the subject no, I, I, refuses to be represented by a signifier for another signifier, in which cases you foreclose the signifier. The signifier has been foreclosed. And when the signifier is foreclosed, what's traumatic is the whole that that signifier can produce in the singularity. So now you say a word, I'm triggered. Well, that's what a signifier does. It's a trigger. Signifiers are triggers. It doesn't matter what signifier you use, it's a potential trigger. You can't know in advance because it's the signifier as such that triggers. And unless you've uh, accepted the triggering effect of the signifier, you're destined to be traumatized. To be traumatized is different than to have accepted trauma in the primordial trauma of your encounter with the signifier or something like that. So what happens when you foreclose the signifier? Well, suddenly you isolate from the language of, the, of others. Oh, Jacques Lamelaire is transphobic. His, did you read what he said? His words, I'm sorry, I've read it. What I saw was a man who enjoyed his unconscious, who played with language, who integrated the signifier. I didn't see anything transphobic in Miller's work. Maybe there was, and I have to go back and read it. I could be convinced. I could be, I'm not just saying that. I, maybe I missed something there. But in the same way, I think that this is what we're witnessing today. You know, I was listening to the radio and I'm not suggesting that this is a problem, like this is something that we should not do. I'm just stating with the, how the world is structured today. I was listening to the radio today in Ireland while I was driving, 
And, you know, this community is upset and they're boycotting this other company because of a word they used. And this, we're, this is the period we're listening. We're, 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 we're listening to. This is the period we're in. It's a world without a period. And it just goes on and on and on, you know? And so, and I'm not suggesting that somehow there's, there's something wrong here. We are triggered. And when we are triggered, I think we should have empathy. It's not a good feeling to be traumatized and triggered and to be insulted. It's not a good feeling. But this, this, is, the, this is the world we're in. There's no subject anymore, you know? in the early middle period of Lacan, the subject can only be there as a condition of lack, which means you've internalized the signifier. In the late Lacan, where's the subject? What you have is the parletre, who is a being of jouissance. What type of jouissance? If the subject is a lack, the parletre is a bubble of an affirmative. There's no prohibition to it an affirmative view of science. That's, tra that's potentially traumatizing. So it's about how do, we, how do we move forward? You know, I'm just describing it. I'm not suggesting we go around popping bubbles. Wouldn't, wouldn't the power be an answer to trauma or insofar that trauma is, is, is born of constitutive lack? And so, therefore, the 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 palette is is a type of affirmation that can move us beyond uh, the language, the pervasive language of trauma. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm misinterpreting. No, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not as experienced as you. No, I, I I I think that's exactly what it is. You know, because what what the parletta is is a post traumatic subject. Is a subject without trauma. And, and wow. in some sense, we are all these. Uh, Vulcan, I think you were next. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Um, yeah, well, thanks for your great presentation and Mark for your question. I, I had also something to say, because uh, a comment more like a side cut to what Mark said about like oh, talking about trauma as a loosely or as a technical term. Well, does it make a difference? I will uh, to say, like I uh, had to ask, does it really make a difference? Because like, you know, well, what's the difference? Just to let you think about that. Well, I was, uh, I had a question about jokes, but when you mentioned about jokes, which I find interesting beyond, you know, the, the, the subconscious uh, notion of it but uh, then also how you ended made me feel like asking the question first but, um, because I don't really understand it really well and it's a basic question that if you know you talk about cartel uh, it's not about you know fraternity and so on and, and then isn't that also close to say like what's the difference of it between sainthood you know I, I, I made me think of this uh, and wonder what you have to say about that. Yeah, it's good. Um, the first question is really good. I think, you know, one of the things, one of, one of the problems is the word trauma. You know, you kind of have to listen to each person one by one in how they use the word, Can, like, you know, is it a signifier? Is it a sign? Is it, what is it? And so I, I do think it could mean different things. I think it's possible for somebody to use the word, the word trauma in a way where I don't think what we're talking about is trauma at all, because these are just signifiers in the end, right? You know, when we talk about trauma, we have to talk about it at the level of structure. There's a trauma at the level of structure. And maybe what somebody calls a trauma is a trauma. Maybe what another person calls a panic attack is a trauma, but they don't call it a trauma. <laughs> you know, so it's, um, I don't know, that would be my answer. The second, the second question, um, I've already lost it. Sainthood. Yeah, about uh, Sainthood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, relation to it, to, to the cartel and the members of the cartel, you know, this. Uh, yeah, well, well, I don't know, because when I think of sainthood, you know, because Zizek, wrote this fantastic piece for Crisis and Critique that I always find myself returning to because it has, well, most, mostly because of the title more than the article itself. 
Is it possible to exit the capitalist discourse without becoming a saint? He asked a question. Um, and the saint for Lacan in his late teaching, it was related to what he called the saint homme. Saint, you know it better than I do, probably Vulcan, yeah? It's like the saint homme, saintly man or whatever. Man, saintly man. Uh, and, um, or St. Thomas or symptom, which is really what he was talking about, the symptom. But it's, it's a different type of symptom because you're not talking about a symptom that can experience relief through interpretation. There's no therapeutic effects when we're talking about St. Tom, when we're talking about symptom, perhaps. But when we're talking about St. Tom, suddenly we shift into the register of Chouassant and outside of the symbolic. And the St. Tom is a way of, in my understanding, spontaneously, it's a way of discussing how you can hold it all together when there's no nom de pair, when there's no master, no father, and maybe no fraternity. But so the centum is a solution, a way of tying things together. But I think that there's something, and maybe I'm wrong in my reading. I, I'm going to have to go look at the, because it is, a, again, a technical concept. The saint is the one for, in some sense, who I worry can master you a sense. Like I can imagine the saint living a holy life off in a corner somewhere. Just master of his Jewish And I don't think you can have too many saints in a cartel if the plus one is, is functioning. Because suddenly you're not master of your Jewish because the question drives you and now you aspire to answer it or something. So I don't know. I used to put a lot of stake in the concept of the saint. I'm not. I'm not quite sold on it as any sort of a, a fundamental solution. Uh, but it's well, that's that I remember was that the stuff that we were discussing, wasn't it, last time in the in the, the contact? The, the the saint doesn't work. Um, oh, it doesn't work. Yeah, <laughs> it was the idea. This uh, the saint doesn't need to work, and ultimately that the whole point. Of the cartel is 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 that uh, the, the 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 constant need for novelty and the constant need for mm -hmm. invention, the constant need to bring a world forward. If, you, if yeah, in our parlance, in terms yeah. of it, and the saint is is you know is the mirror inverse of the one of the psychotic in the sense of the one who is without a world but isn't enjoying. The saint is without a world and it's enjoying. You know, <laughs> it reminds me of um of of uh, a little story from Buddhism. I'm going to tell it poorly, but you know, Buddha was inspired by these monks who starved themselves, their bodies become decimated, you know, and he, he left the city or wherever he was into a cave and just starved. And at one point he had this moment of enlightenment or something. And he said, why am I starving myself? Like, why am I alone in a cave enlightenment? And then he suddenly comes out and he accepts food from these women and he, he gets, and he decides to move close, not entirely in the city, but let's say on the periphery of the city and the forest or something like that. And what does he do at that point? Does he sit and dwell in his isolation, master of his Jewish like all those other monks who died in the lotus position? Or does he begin to teach? He begins to teach. He gets to work. And so he was, um, I, I'm not sure Buddha was entirely a saint. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's something there. He, he, he knew that he needed some connection to the social bond, some link. Um, I think that's a, that's a, that's a nice to summarize. I think I nearly called you cyber daddy, or did I call you cyber daddy? Cyber Dandy. You know, I've gotten that in Cyber Candy and uh, a few other interesting spins on the name, all of which I enjoy. Uh -huh. So just uh, I had a couple quick questions and then more of a follow up uh, of some of my thoughts. Um, I don't really understand what the analyst is in uh, uh, Lacan's four discourses and also when you talk about the master, does that translate roughly to something like the pre-Socratic idea of the arc, 
like the organizing principle. Yeah, I think so. You know, what you just made me think of though is that I wonder if I've been using these terms a little loosely like master, because you're right, there's like a master in the master's discourse. And when Lacan's introducing the master's discourse, which is different from master of Jewishops, or is it? That's what I need to think about. The master in the master's discourse is, uh, yeah. well, you know, the example Lacan gave, he said, the master of the master's discourse is like a, a Zen Buddhist monk, in fact. He, um, he makes, he gets, he gets things started with a sound. Maybe it's one hand clapping or something, but he gets things started, he, just a sound. And then of course it, it, it forms a relationship I call it the rush to knowledge, S2, which is what it points at in the master's discourse. If you follow it, S1, master point is, is, is in some relationship with S2, which is in the position of the other. And the position of S2 is knowledge. So knowledge is, I don't know, the slave. The slave tries to figure it all out and, and make sense of it and, and make it consistent. Figure out what the heck I've been talking about today or something, you know? and. Um, I don't know, Socrates, there's something No, the pre-Socratics. Oh, you said pre-Socratics. Yeah, so like Anaxama, they're these Greek names I have trouble with, but they're all concerned with figuring out what the arc was, what this fundamental principle was mm -hmm. that, uh, so one of them would say it's water, another one would say it's fire, then you had Heraclitus and Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that that has a relationship to what Lacan is saying uh, when he's talking about the master. I, I think so. It sounds like what you're talking about is what Lacan might have at one time called the phallus. But I but I it's just an intuition. I don't know. There's something there definitely to be explored. Um, I need to think about it a bit more. OK, uh, and can you just explain what the analyst is a little more? Just that's new to me. Oh, I'm going to be honest, I don't know what the analyst is. Uh, we know that there's an analytical discourse. What is an analyst? All right. <laughs> Fair know. enough. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I don't want to put you on the spot. What uh, do you sorry, think? just uh, I've, yep. I've, I've, I've got to shoot. I've got to go. But I will say thank you very much. And uh, I'll well, easily clock that question, but I'll, thanks, I'll have to go. Yeah, yeah thanks, Mark. Maybe, Maybe. Yeah, thank you. And I think what we can do is I'll, I'll finish it with this. Um, uh, so, what do you think was Sterner's major contribution? Well, that's actually where I was going to go next. I thought uh, what Roman said was about the distinction between revolt and revolution was really important. And uh, for me, I blunt, you know, that bleeds right into my study of Albert Camus, who also makes a distinction between revolt and revolution along similar lines. Mm -hmm. um, as far as major contribution, I, I definitely would say the anti-essentialist position he takes, uh, displacing the ego and resolving things back to a nothingness. But I think his mistake is to seek to become his own foundation. And this is a critique that you find in uh, Ludwig Binswanger, who is a German psychoanalyst, existentialist. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but the real thing I wanted to get to is there's this incredible similarity between the union, the, this notion of the union of egoists, um, what you seem to be describing as the cartel, um uh the affinity group and what sartre calls the group infusion and i think a broad comparison of those four notions in each of their each of their philosophies would show a lot of similarity in what they're getting at each with their own uh contributions to a bigger theory of what an affinity group is and why it has a uh, 
different place in the social world than uh, a organization or a fraternity. And Sartre was always pretty, uh, he was pretty insistent that fraternities and a, what he calls groups and fusion are different because a fraternity functions on a notion of terror. Um, so there is a form of master to uh, within even the fraternal organization. And yeah, that's something I definitely want to talk with you about more some other time, but it's just, uh, it's a really big conversation to be had. That yeah, is. I love this concept of group infusion. Could you tell me again in, uh, what that means in, in a word, group infusion? Yeah, so it's group hyphen in hyphen fusion. Uh, at least that's how it's translated. And it comes out of Sartre's late work, Critique of Dialectical Reason. And basically what he's doing is he's describing how uh, a society starts off in a state of seriality, meaning in relation to objects, uh, each person can be replaced and have the same um, positionality, right? So an example he gives is people waiting at a bus stop. They're in a serial relation with each other. It doesn't really matter who is in what um, numerical order, uh, what ordinal position, they could all be interchanged, but they all have this relation towards the bus, towards the material object that brings them together into a group. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, using this to discuss sort of what the common uh, situation is in our society where we are in a serial arrangement. Mm -hmm. But what, the, what happens is there is some sort of trauma uh, or there is some sort of threat that causes people to fuse together into what he calls the group infusion. And they are brought together through an external relation, but they share the same goal, the same project. Mm -hmm. And so um, he uses the uh, storming of the Bastille as his historical example of when a group infusion formed to accomplish some goal. But then he also carries this further to talk about why it transforms into the uh into the um uh fraternity mm -hmm. which seeks to then turn back on itself and understand itself as an object and preserve itself mm -hmm. so the group infusion is primarily caused through negation but then as it turns back onto itself it seeks to keep itself together through fraternity terror and mm -hmm. this would and this would be why uh he has such a uh emphasis in in that book between a group infusion and a fraternity and then he later talks about institutions and organizations and other forms of groups what what what, what is the terror exactly so um, so terror is the way that the group maintains itself through the threat of exclusion. Ah. And the principle of that fraternal group is another concept he uses called the oath. Mm. So, or it might be called a constitution in some other uh, discourses, but basically this notion that the, the group... Um, seeks to maintain itself and develops a sort of uh, objective criteria for belonging and then through its um, own attempts to maintain itself as a group positively, it does this basically through terrorizing uh, each, each person in the group is a potential uh, threat to kicking someone out. Yeah. 
and exposing them or canceling them as a uh, as um, not loyal, not true to the cause. So it's a so form of I, terror based on what I hear yeah. though is these two sort of positions, if I'm hearing you correctly. One is a seriality of the group in relation to the object outside of the group, which is the bus, which they're waiting to get on or whatever. And the other one is a, a, a group that's a, like a fusional group um, where the threat is inside the group that you might be excommunicated. And what I wonder is if there's a third one. The third well, one is the group of yeah, the threat of being run over by the bus, which is the signifier. Well, that, it, yeah, so that's the group in fusion, that mm -hmm. third one. Mm -hmm. um, the two you heard, the seriality and, is one of them. And the second one you described was the fraternity group. But the group in fusion is that threatened group, the one that's threatened by a war or threatened by uh, the bus. In your yeah. Example. yeah, I hear you. Thank you so much for that. That's that's um, that's quite fascinating, um, folks. I think I'm going to bring it to an end because it's been a while. I'm I'm very tired. I think um, Cyber Dandy, you and I are doing something uh, together. When is it? You want to say? Oh, your mic. Hold on. Oh, that, that's okay. We can. What we can do is we can put it on the event page. Yeah, we, we can't hear you, or at least I can't. Oh, there. sorry. It's Saturday, the 2nd of July. Okay. It's like a podcast. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, folks. Thank you so much for being all right, here. Thanks. All these familiar faces. Thanks, all of you. Bye, everyone.